as the national committee of e-commerce in Indonesia. E-commerce Indonesia would like to contribute to the global celebration of the World Heritage Day by holding a talk show that raises the role of art in, in, in voicing the importance of mitigating climate change and global warming. The talk show aims to showcase ways of arts have been used to address climate change by presenting three speakers that will be introduced later by our moderator, whose creative works have been focused on the mitigation of the impact of climate change and global warming. We will start our talk show today with opening remarks from Mr. Suhardi Hartono as the president of ICOMAS Indonesia, followed by Ms. Reta Dunga as the executive board member of Koalisi Seni, and last but not least, Ms. Asanti Astari, the founder of Expressi. Dear Pak Suhardi, the screen is yours. Yeah, hi everybody, good morning. Can, can, you, can you hear my voice? Okay, uh, very warm welcome to all our colleagues from e-commerce Indonesia and uh, from Expressi and also from Koalisi Seni and especially very warm greetings to all uh, the participants of this uh, very important seminar, very important webinar. Um, we are glad that uh, after such a quite short preparation with such tremendous uh, support and uh, spirit of collaboration among e-commerce Indonesia and uh, of course with Expressi and Koalisi Seni and of course with our distinguished uh, speakers Ibu Laretna and uh, Ibu Mariana Isa from e-commerce uh, uh, Malaysia. Finally we are able to present to you uh, our kind of uh, way of celebrating the International Day of Monuments and Sites as have been celebrated by all our colleagues, the heritage activists and practitioners all around the world. As we know that uh, around a week ago on 18 April, uh, internationally, we are celebrating the World Heritage Day uh, campaigned by e-commerce since 1982, uh, or in other words, it is called the International Day for Monuments and Sites. And this year's theme is heritage and climate. And uh, we are very happy to be able to present such distinguished speakers today to share their points of view of how these pressing issues of climate change could be addressed, could be uh, solved uh, through the uh, activism in heritage conservation and arts. And of course, how the intangible cultural heritage also could play a role in this very important task. So uh, without further ado, I really uh, looking forward, I'm really looking forward to hear from our distinguished speakers, Ibu Laretna Adisakti from e-commerce Indonesia and Ibu Mariana Isa from e-commerce Malaysia. And then Ibu Nova Ruth, a cultural arti an artifist and cultural and a cultural and environmental artifist and a sailor, that's amazing. And, uh, we, we look forward to the enlightening uh, speeches. And uh, let me, please allow me also to welcome you later on today, uh, this afternoon at 1500 or 3 p.m. Uh, Jakarta time for another webinar presented by e-commerce Indonesia, which we will present uh, our distinguished speakers from e-commerce Philippines, Mr. Gabriel Victor Caballero and our dear colleague from e-commerce Indonesia, Punto Wijayanto, they are going to speak about heritage and climate, but perhaps from quite another uh, different point of view. So I really welcome you all, and hopefully we really could enjoy these talks and inspire us to, to make our own efforts, our own steps, how to mitigate this climate change, especially from the role of arts and cultural heritage conservation. Thank you, Ami. Thank you, dear all speakers. Thank you, Pak Suhardi, for your warm, warm welcome to the talk show and your encouragement for us to continue and increase the leverage of our works and our collaboration. Next, I would like to invite Ms. Reta Dunga, representing Koalisi Seni. 
Okay, thank you. Um, good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you, Pak Suhari Hartono, e-commerce Indonesia President. Uh, also, Mbak Asanti Astari, uh, Expressive Founder and Distinguished Speakers, Mariana Isa, Novarut, and Dr. Laratna Disakti. Happy World Heritage Day and Happy Earth Day to all. Um, we have a fine Saturday morning here in Jakarta after a uh, hard pouring rain yesterday. Um, so Koalisi Seni is established in uh, 2012 as an arm for artists to advocate better public policy in art sector. Uh, thank you, Mbak Santi and Expressi for approaching us. Uh, we are honored to be part of this important topic for discussion one uh, that needs to be addressed by all as um, we are complicit and all at risk due to climate crisis. Uh, often highlighting destruction trends, help people imagine the inevitable, the extinction of species and show public how they can respond best with mitigating actions, learning from existing local practices and traditions. We also know art help people experience and appreciate healthy environment. So they are compelled to compare the stark condition of current pollution and nature in the past that enveloped human uh, existence and civilization. Art connects us with ideas through various senses, invoking emotions to stop abandoning impacts of capitalism and excess goods and consumptions. However, to contribute to even more productive discussion, um, I feel it is important to also highlight practices in the creative and art industry itself. How far has it contributed to sustainable practices? What kind of paint and coloring we use that is safe for the environment? What kind of plastics we use to create art that is not damaging in the long run? How big the emission caused by artistic NFT trading and how are we trying to offset them? So we believe by truly practicing sustainable actions, we could then be really effective in influencing wider audience of the art world. So finally, I believe this discussion could be a great step for Quality Sunni and partners in engaging challenges of climate crisis and its impact to the arts ecosystem. I'll stop here, thank you, and uh, have a great discussion. Thank you, Ms. Reta Dunga, for your remarks and for stressing how art plays important role in raising awareness of climate issues. I would like now to invite Ms. Asanti Astari as the founder of Expressi. Thank you, Ami. Uh, hello and good morning to everyone. It's my pleasure to be here as well and for organizing this important event together with ICOMOS Indonesia and Koalisi Sumi. My name is Asanti, the founder of Expressi. Expressi is a new startup. Uh, we aim to build a marketplace for Indonesian traditional performing arts and connect public with the traditional performing artists from across Indonesia. Uh, we're happy to be here and to join uh, Commerce and Quality in this important mission. And we want to portray and to, to put a spotlight on how arts can be used as a, as a medium and as a creative platform to, to voice a mission, in this case of climate change and global warming. And I hope we can continue to engage art in creative ways to support this mission continuously. Uh, in terms of Expressi, our, our platform is currently underway, but we would be happy to have your support by joining us in our social media channels and be part of our growing community. Thank you very much. And I hope that you all enjoy today's talk show. Back to you, Amna. Thank you, Mbak Santi. Before we begin our talk show, let me introduce our moderator that will guide us through today's discussion. Our moderator is T. Cilik Pamungkas, a cultural conservation practitioner with an experience as a dancer and theater actress. She holds a bachelor degree in English literature from State University of Yogyakarta and a master degree in international relations from Muhammadiyah University Yogyakarta. Cilik has been actively involved in artistic activities since her junior high school years and joined 
Country Theater from 2008 until 2018. She has numerous experience working in the cultural sector, such as in Bagong Kusudiarjo Foundation, Anak Cilik Indonesia, and UNESCO Jakarta. Since 2019, she joined Ekor Hotel Group and introduced art and culture as one of the brand passions of the company. Without further ado, I will hand this screen to Ms. Cilik. Yeah, thank you, Mbak Abi. First of all, I would like to greet you all. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. Welcome to the talk show, The Role of Art in Mitigating the Impact of Climate Change. And secondly, let me introduce my name. My name is Julie Tripamungas, the moderator today. And this session will be divided into two, into two sessions. The first is presentation by the speakers, and the second is question and answer. And let me introduce you with the speakers today. The first we have Ms. Mariana Isa. She holds a Bachelor of Architecture degree from the University of Technology Malaysia and Master of Science in Conservation of Historic Building from the University of the United Kingdom. And now she is the Honorary Secretary of iCommerce Malaysia. And, oh sorry, for 2020 until 2022, and currently iCommerce Malaysia Chairman of Interpretation and Presentation Committee. And then the second one, we have our Ibu, yeah, Ibu Sati, Ibu Larenda T. Adi Sakti from Jakarta. She is a lecturer and coordinator of the Center for Heritage Conservation Department of Architecture and Planning, Faculty of Engineering, Gajah Mada University. Also active as the co-founder and presidium for Indonesian Heritage Trust, um, board and advisor for Jogja Heritage Society, and also uh, expert for the Sekar Jagat Pati Society and board member for Traditional Textile Art Society of Southeast Asia. And we still have a lot of profile from Ibu Satya. And last but not least, we have Ms. Nova Rut Setianing uh, a famous artist, a musician. Uh, she is a live artist, a writer, and also singing. And if I can see, I watched her performance yesterday uh, in the YouTube. Let me read a sentence here. Ibu bumi yang dulunya tampak lebih dari hijau, yang kini tergantikan dengan tanah kekeringan, dan air bak di sisi lain ibu bumi terus bertahan. So this is the difference between arts or intangible heritage as a campaign, as a medium of campaign or promotion with other with other uh, promotion or campaign type. If we see a performance, uh, even with uh, the video, is only the video, not the live uh, live performance of this Nova or if you see theater coma or paper moon puppet or watching another uh, intangible culture, uh, cultural heritage performance. The message is not only goes to our brain, but it goes to our heart and become the memorable experience for us. So I'm very happy to uh, know that I come as playing the same heritage and climate here. And now today we are going to talk about the role of arts in mitigating the impact of climate change. Uh, first one, I would like to invite Ms. Maria Isa Hello. to share your presenta presentation with us. Great. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Chile. And um, hello, Samoa, and happy World Heritage Day. Um, I, I'd like first to thank Ikemos uh, Indonesia for the invite. I think this is probably the first time, if not only the second time, Ikemos Malaysia and Ikemos Indonesia have actually communicated formally and on an online webinar. Uh, so I, I think this kind of sessions, uh, we should really have it more often. I, I don't know why we've never had similar arrangements before, uh, but today is a good start. Uh, so I am, my name is Mariana. I was formerly the Honorary Secretary of Ikumbos Malaysia. We just had our elections a few weeks ago. Uh, so now it's handed over to architect Zulhem Lee. There's a new batch of board members, all very passionate and enthusiastic about heritage. Uh, for today, um, I am honored to share the screen with Ibu Laretna, with Chilik, 
and with Nova. Uh, but before I start, I just want to declare that I am not an artist. Um, although I find it very hard to define what exactly I do nowadays because the job scope that is available out there it's so varied and it's so fluid. There's a lot of overlapping and you find yourself doing bits of everything, right? Uh, but but an, a performing artist, a professional artist, I am not, <laughs> just to make that clear. I don't wanna um, I think intrude in other people's um, territory. Uh, so, but Ratri from Ikomos Indonesia, who, who invited me, uh, told me today's session is more like a chit chat, you know, talk about the issue, talk about maybe, uh, what can be done. Uh, so what I'm sharing today is uh, basically my personal uh, views about heritage and climate change, where we're headed, and, um, you know, based on my, my observations and understanding. So I will share my screen here. Okay. Could you... Could you all see my screen? Yes. 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 Oh, it doesn't. Let me try that again. Okay. So um, I find that climate change or proven eclim is really a term or phrase that is thrown around quite a lot. Uh, <laughs> Up to an extent, it, it becomes really vague, uh, but it's not something that the grassroots could actually talk at a deeper level uh, at, at, say, the coffee shops, right? Because it's something that is quite complicated because uh, it involves, you know, CO2 molecules, radioactive, um, sea levels rising. So it's not, you, you can see, you can understand why it's hard to communicate the message, um, especially to people from, a country like ours, from a tropical country like ours, where the climatic environment is just either hujan atau panas, you know, panas atau hujan lebat, <laughs> hujan ragai. So it, it's, um, it's not something that we could grasp immediately. And also the usage of scientific and academic terms when explaining uh, this subject, uh, it does not help either. And I, I think like, firstly, we're left with the notion that there's nothing that we can actually do collectively uh, to counter or address um, the climate change issue because it, it's presented in such a complicated manner. And in Malaysia, I mean, just the phrase, the, the term, uh, definition that I'm sharing, uh, it doesn't have, <laughs> it, it, it takes you a while to grasp what it actually is. Uh, and in Malaysia, presumably the same in Indonesia, uh, climate change does affect us. Uh, it's, it's very obvious. Uh, we have droughts, we have floods, uh, rising sea level, uh, increasing temperature. I live in Kuala Lumpur, the capital city of Malaysia, and it's located in an area called um, the Klang Valley. I've lived in Kuala Lumpur since 1987, and I've had the unfortunate uh, firsthand experience of um, you know urban heat wave or urban uh, heat island phenomena, which is the increasing temperature by rapid urban development. Um, and rapid development, uh, rapid urban development is also an aspect uh, that is indirectly linked to climate change, but it's uh, not often pointed out that way. Uh, most of the mitigation are very physical. You know, the local authorities are building uh, covered pedestrian walkways, cycling paths to encourage people to um, not use um, cars and vehicles to reduce the CO2 emission. Uh, a lot of urban planting is attempted. And then there's a lot of uh, promotion about renewable energy. But um, yes, sorry, this was the Kuala Lumpur. I forgot to change my slide. <laughs> this is the Kuala Lumpur that I am from. I, I thought of putting in, you know, the nice, uh, <laughs> nice sceneries and all, but no. This is the reality that I face every day. It's just outside my housing area. Uh, now, last year, there was a really bad flood last December. And I tell you, we are in Kuala Lumpur, we're used to floods, we're used to the monsoon, but what 
uh, the, the, pheno the phenomena in December was beyond uh, the normal occurrence. A lot of people lost their homes. A lot of people were trapped. Uh, some of my friends, even uh, Ikhtar Muslim Malaysia members were victims of this uh, situation. And while sitting at home, because we were trapped, we could, could, couldn't go anywhere. A lot of the access roads were underwater. Uh, it got me to think like, is this, how we approach, I mean, like, how are we going to approach these kind of issues? Is something actually going to, is, is something good going to come out of this uh, situation? Are we finally going to admit uh, to ourselves that, you know, what we're, we're we, there's uh, definitely a problem <laughs> with how we treat our environment, environment, what are we actually doing? Will we flip 180 degrees and, you know, take radical action. Uh, so it's been a few months. Um, <laughs> I'm not, I was actually hoping for something more progressive uh, to, to come out of that, but uh, we, we, I'm still assessing. But holding that thought and then going into arts, uh, as an individual, um, I have been brought up to appreciate arts. And while I'm not an artist, I love, I love going to art galleries. I love watching performances. I am a good observer. And um, what art does, it evokes your emotion and empathy and connects you to your self-conscious. And it, growing up in an urban area, um, it really is an outlet that I would need to you know, let out all my steam. Uh, I love dancing. So I, I'm blessed to have some traditional dance training when I was younger. But sadly also, I have had the uh, unfortunate experience of um, witnessing how dance, for example, um, has uh, social dancing, whether traditional or modern, has uh, declined in terms of popularity. Um, I come from a generation where the, if that's good music, if that's a good band, you know, we go like, woo! Uh, but the recent events that I attended uh, before the MCO uh, was very different, you know, culturally. A lot of people were just like standing, uh, recording on their phones, you know, like zombies. I, I, I don't think it's because they don't know how to dance, but it's more of that resistance to uh, letting go of themselves or expressing. And uh, I visited, I, I got to revisit uh, my sense of self or how do you say, my self-conscious as an adult when I met um, uh, Diane Butler. Uh, a brilliant movement artist who's based in Bali. I think she's, I think she's uh, in, uh, is attending this session. Uh, if you are there, Diane, hello. <laughs> uh, so her work basically uh, is about body movement practice. Uh, she dances at heritage sites and it's a lot about uh, contextual dancing and connection, how you see yourself or how you feel um, and then how you transmit it. Um, to the um, your to outside, um, although I've never had any formal um, training sessions with her, but I was quick to understand uh, from her, like from from observing her, that there is no way we can connect to our environment uh, at a deeper level if we don't connect with ourselves from within. And this is what art can actually do for you. So when it's missing, that connection is you know is also very loose. Now, through one of the sessions that Diane invited me to uh, in Gunung Lau, I met with two brilliant puppeteers. Uh, one is Ada Denok. I'm not sure if you can see my mouse, uh, but she's the one with the white in the white tee. Uh, you can see her mouse? Oh, okay, okay. That's her. <laughs> she's awesome. Uh, so Ada Denok is from the Wayang Sampa group. Uh, what they do is they create puppets from trash and then perform theatrically. I think on the left here, these are some of um, perform their performances. And uh, they go to rural areas to perform, but at the same time, uh, they attempt to educate and communicate with the co local community, teach them about recycling, alternatives to plastic, uh, things like that. And it really opened my eyes to what um, groups of artists or groups of people could actually do in terms of outreach. and. Uh, the kind of impact that they have, the immediate impact that they have uh, to the community, especially um, the younger, the younger children. And the other person 
is Nanu. She's the one with the bun uh, right here. Uh, she is from France, and um, well, she, we we got a little bit. Uh, we we got. She became a close friend because she hung out in KL for a while. Uh, at that time, two thousand eighteen, sometime there, uh, she was traveling the world, um, visiting all the puppeteers to learn and to you know um, exchange some knowledge. And while in Kuala Lumpur, uh, she did a mini performance um using a puppet made from um, rubbish she collected from all her travels and that's that's one on the bottom bottom right uh and and then the 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 extent to her thought process the materials that she collects the story the narrative that was um conveyed um really had an impact on me so personally i've experienced that uh the engagement uh with an artist although not not um, not directly, but as a viewer, as an observer, uh, it has really opened up my eyes, and especially about the role of an artist uh, or a role of a, an individual in a in a society. Now, um, in Malaysia, there are of course uh, a lot and a great number of artists who are tackling the climate ch change challenges. Uh, last year. Uh, Red Hong Yi, Red Hong Yi, right here. Uh, her art piece was featured on the cover of the Times magazine, which was quite a big thing. And it was part of a sculpture, part performing art team constructed this giant world map using matchsticks. Okay, I've not seen matchsticks for a while. Um, and then after it got, was completed, they set fire to the artwork to represent how the global climate crisis touches us all, no matter where we are, no matter we, where we live. Um, and then there's also this uh, guy here, the one on the right. Um, his name is Shak Koyok. Uh, he's an uh, indigenous um, artist who's also a cultural activist. Uh, he advocates for cultural rights. Uh, my friend Juntan mentioned him to me. Uh, yesterday, but I've read a lot about him uh, because he's involved, actively involved in trying to stop uh, development in one of our forest reserves. And the kind of art he does, he draws, he draws his inspiration from uh, the Orang Asli group. He's a term one himself. Um, so these four or five uh, artists I mentioned, they are all actively contributing to the global discourse of the global movement. Uh, that has to do with heritage or climate change awareness, whether they realize it or not. And same goes to you know all the artists uh, that are uh, producing work uh, uh, about uh, in line with this. Uh, there's definitely a build up, and people artists are actually are definitely responding uh, to the issue, um, and 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 that's actually a really good. Um, Good, um, good, good, good thing to to know. So, okay, the role of art in mitigating climate change—that was the uh, subject given. So, I agree definitely that art has a role, uh, can play a role because it does help us to delve into the complexity of climate change, deepen personal engagement. Um, what we can do, I have some suggestions here. Of course, it's every every um, suggestion of course there are challenges. Uh, it's not like you can immediately implement, but scientists and artists definitely can work together. Um, I think you could. Um, it's really important for them to integrate, and the artists' uh, role they should not just be like the buffers or. The communicators, although they, they're great communicators, of course, but they shouldn't just be the communicator uh, between the public and the scientific uh, data. But what, what artists could do is really ignite conversations about the subject because they're great at it. They're, everything becomes more interesting when artists are involved, <laughs> uh, especially when the subject matter is very complex. So as opposed to science, I'm not, I'm not belittling them, but they, they have uh, academicians or scientists have the tendency to lean their data towards you know objectivity. So that's one. And then education can be experiential 
what I mean is uh, we, we don't have to force the subject on our students. You know, it, can, it doesn't have to be just all theoretical. Um, it has to be something that we can experience, uh, maybe teach them through art, music, um, uh, craft work, and, and I think this is a more effective way to do so because they would be able to think critically without, without even realizing the heaviness of the subject and then expand their perimeter of what an art and climate project could look like. And then the third uh, efforts must be continuous and consistent uh, because otherwise, <laughs> There is really no point. It has to be ongoing. I'm I'm just gonna give an example. Um, in my in my housing area, there's a, there's a, there was a green area on a slope, and students from the schools here were invited. This is about ten years ago. Each were given a tree to plant. Okay, it was part of an environment day activity. So all the students planted uh, one tree. Uh, 100 trees, yeah, 100 trees. I think 100 trees were planted to make that statement. But uh, five, six years later, all those trees were chopped off for a condo development. So it really, the, <laughs> the message has to be, you know, you, you cannot disrupt it like that because it really disrupts the, uh, the a person's sense of belief and values. You know, the, we, we must have... Um, we must be able to instill the idea that there is actually hope and then what we are doing will benefit the future generation. Uh, and then art administrators can develop strategic plans, not just for networking among artists, scientists, or other kinds of, of collaborators, but the focus could also be on the impact or studies on the impact uh, of, to the audience, uh, how far, how, how well are the artworks uh, as uh, uh, accepted, how 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 far is the message um, conveyed? You know how successful it is. I, there's no way to measure how successful it is, but there definitely needs to be uh, a bit more research or study on how the audience take it. And then finally, a collective effort at a regional level because um, climate change is not a localized phenomena. Uh, there's a whole lot that um, we can do collectively uh, as a community. So instead of um, I, 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 every, every single project or every single artwork, uh, every single product by an artist, how no matter how small the scale contributes to the global uh, climate change movement. Uh, so if you look at it uh, in an isolated manner, it may not have a big impact, but if you accumulate it, uh, there is some weight there. So that's um, all I have to say for this session. I'm, uh, my, I'm closing my thread of opinions and I look forward to discussing this, um, these ideas later. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Mariana Isa. Very interesting. I think a lot of people have uh, many questions for you, but please wait yeah, until question and answer session. Okay. We will continue with our second speaker. We have Ms. Larna, Adi Sakti, Ibu Sita. Ibu Sita, good morning, Ibu Sita. Morning, Bacili. Okay, Ibu, so the time is yours. Okay, I will directly share my presentation. Ibu dan Bapak sekalian, my dear friends, wherever you are, good morning. And Let's we discuss, and I will focus my presentations on the issues of the indigo batik. It is a natural indigo batik. I'm not an artist in he here, but I'm more in the management. And this is my experience in managing and promoting the natural indigo batiks from our uh, family brand. It's called Gallery Batik Jawa or GBG. And uh, you can see also here is we, tr we try to, to utilize those uh, natural indigo batik for our target. It's not just uh, major people, but also uh, millennial and also the seniors. 
And before I mention about what we are doing, now I would like to mention a little bit about what is Patik. And Patik originating from the Javanese word, what is called Patika. But the Javanese people usually cannot say Patika, but more in a Patika. Patika is an order. Please write or paint any flora, fauna, or environments wherever you are. Uses a wax resist dyeing process or color blocking. And originally, everything they use natural dye. So this is the ones that uh, we will focus on the use utilizations of the natural dye. And Batik of Indonesia is a masterpiece of oral intangible heritage of humanity from Indonesia. And we have also others like uh, Pramanan Temple and also Wayang. And from those world heritage, we can learn that in the relief of Prambanan Temple, in the Wayang story, in the Batik pattern, they highlight the importance of ecological learning. So there is uh, something that uh, we will talk about right now, the climate change. The ecological is there already thousand years. So what we have to do is we have to reinvent it. Like for instance, the patterns of Parang that I try to learn about this. What is actually they, they, they try to uh, transform the, from the environments so like this one? Is an ancient mountain Langerang is uh, already thousand years also the ancient mountain, and we can see the parang uh, motif is this. Uh, you can see this one, what is called the parang, and inside of the parang there is a, what is called the mlinjon. Mlinjon is water resources like the one here, or you can see also this is the the. Uh, drainage of the water like this. And this is what we call it the magical power of water resources. And the parang itself is a metaphor of sharp stones. So you, you can, you, you can, we can learn from this one. And ancient mountain Langeran is also UNESCO uh, Geopark and Yogyakarta. So a lot of places in Yogyakarta that we can learn what's come from. For instance, like this, also about floral, many types of floral. If you go to the mountains, also another mountain, Merapi volcanoes, you can see also that's many, many types of the uh, floral that also transform into batik patterns. We can, we can learn not only the floral itself, but also the natural environments into the batik patterns. And for instance, coffee bean batik patterns from traditional can be, become a contemporary designs done by Kaleri Batik Jawa. You can see this is very traditional ones, what is called the broken coffee traditional batik patterns. And then with a, a new uh, interpretations of the batik itself on the coffee bean, we can put the flowers, we can put the leaves. And then when we had uh, exhibitions in New York now, this has become the best new product. So Artisan Resource New York now in 2018. So this is the ones that we try to make a contemporary designs of the broken coffee, the traditional one, and can be also become a dancing, performing dance like this. And when we had a, a exhibitions and what we call it also the batik and coffee culture and economic diplomacy in Stockholm and also in Latvia, in Riga, so we can mix between those patterns and also the activities of uh, co coffee cultures. And now who we are. We are as a family business and then uh, lead by my younger sister who are architects. I'm also architects. And Gallery Bate Jawa Indigo established in Yogyakarta, Indonesia 2007. We focus on conserving Indigo Batik, an environmentally friendly written batik with 100% natural dye coloring process from the leaves, what is called the Indigo Vera Tinctoria plant. So this is uh, our pictures when we were in Stockholm with these patterns of coffee bean patterns. And why we have to reuse natural dye? In the end of 18th century, 
Germany introduced synthetic indigo colors. And then almost all Java Island as well as Indonesia has been a big importer of synthetic indigo. And then indigo, Tinctoria natural color civilization is extinct. You can see also this is the, the batiks with uh, synthetic dyes. And we can learn from this the impact of those uh, coloring. We can have the waste problem in Yogyakarta and also synthetic dye waste can contain carcinogen. In 1986, World Craft Council has advocated to reuse the natural coloring on craft and textile. So that's why we had our mission here. That first, we have to safeguard, conserve, and enhance the Japanese local wisdom on natural indigo batik. We can have a traditional batik tool. We still use cultural heritage and batik crafters, and also the environment that the batik makers, they're working at home, at their village. So we can keep the inheritance system from the mother to the child. And we try also to see how we can also do as a bridge for the sustainable development goals. You can see number one, two, 11, and 13. And second mission is we empower the women artisans through safeguarding. Oh, bawa apa tuh, kakak? Many disappear traditional batik villages. You can see this many women and now the young generation also become the batik uh, makers. And from the result of this uh, labor intensive, we can create many kinds of things. For instance, like we started with uh, 2010, we uh, have the blending on natural indigo batik for all seasons. So we can utilize for summer, uh, spring, summer, autumn, and winters. So we also try to the empower of the women artisan as uh, something that become also the bridge for the SDGs. The third missions, we contribute to the environmentally friendly life with using the natural dye. Indigo Vera actually is a, can be grow wildly in Indonesia and easy to cultivate and it used to be the commodity from Indonesia to Europe started in 15 centuries. So it's, they call it a mass biru, blue gold, even more expensive than uh, gold. And this one, so without adding any synthetic dye, no carcinogen. So this is what we are trying to develop more and more on this uh, uh, environmentally friendly life. And you can see also that with this economic circular, we try to develop more and more, and then we can have uh, extensive of the labor that working with us from the uh, farmer, from the tires uh, makers, and then batik makers, and then designers with very simplicity cutting for contemporary fashions. And those motif mostly we use the traditional one. There are thousand traditional um, patterns. And the mission number four, of course, we try to develop Japanese indigo batik for contemporary world fashion, fashion and arts. For instance, uh, we also having a summer course in my university, what is called the uh, Jogja World Batik City for millennials at that moment. And we also uh, try to promote more and more the awakening of Indonesian indigo vera in 2008. This is 100 years after the awakening of Indonesia. And we celebrate in 2018, one decade of the awakening. So we try to develop this and we organize a fashion show in our headquarters in Yogyakarta. And this is a fashion show that reminder an old age of the natural type. And Gallery Batik Jawa also tried to develop more and more Batik as a masterpiece of art. So we uh, participate in several uh, exhibitions like in 
Universitas Gajah Mada, and then in Nantong, China, and in New York, and mostly in the university also, that we try to, to promote more that Batik is not just for fashion, but Batik is also become a masterpiece of art too. And the fifth uh, mission, we use all recycled materials for creative products, up to the smallest one, no waste of cutouts. For instance, you can see the, this mask, uh, this uh, behind the, we can use for the wall and we can have a flowers for the every cutting, no waste that we try to never, we call it never ending pieces, natural indigo batik. And our mission six, we try to promote education for all, cross nation and cross generations. We went to uh, Sri Lanka where there are many batik crafter over there, so we share over there. And we work also for the student, uh, even elementary students, I gave uh, lectures in uh, Taipei National University of the Arts started from how to paint and then how we uh, make a natural dyes. In the last, uh, before pandemic, we went to Lisbon, Portugal, and we have this education forum, how to make the batik. And wherever we go, the most important one is I have to then promote and giving lectures. What is batik? What is the natural dye? What is what is the how to mitigate from the climate change and others? So this is the way that we have to do. And uh, the last missions because batik is a masterpiece of the oral and intangible heritage of humanity, UNESCO 2009, and Jogja, my city itself, has become the world batik city, designated by World Craft Council in 2014. So this is also our responsibility for the world recognition of Indonesian batik, because at that moment, we also part of the people who drafting for these nominations. So we have to be responsible also for this. And to do this, we try to participate with the high class or what we call the curated international folk art markets. For instance, the one in Santa Fe, this is the world and the biggest for folk art market. Uh, 2018, 2000, until 2019, we worked there, we promote there, and interestingly, I think that's the one that we can also learn from them, where the buyers are given educations. When buying traditional folk arts, buyers understand that they have to pay not only the products, but also the welfare of the women, the welfare of the craftsmen, and environmental sustainability. From 2000 uh, applicants, only 150 will be accepted. So we, we were accepted uh, four years uh, before pandemic. And now we try to uh, apply for another uh, curations that hopefully next year we can also participate again. What interesting in this case, they promote that the future is handmade in this international for art. And what is the criteria for the curation itself? The art works must meet artistic quality. The artworks are traditional design and production process. The role and use of artworks in the society. And lastly, the curation, uh, the criteria past curation in the following year, namely innovative in its uh, development. So the batik itself is already have this uh, quality and how we can, we can bring it those originality into innovations through development. And we can meet over there, many countries with Indigo. So this kind of a meeting or reunion for us every year. And we are also learning from world entrepreneurs, for instance, like Donna Karan with her Urban Zen Foundations. 
So what is your, the impact of the products of us? So this kind of thing is very important for us to understand that there are market layers. Even in the seven sky, they are still uh, markets. So don't worry about the, 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 the price of this because the price is included also on the mitigations of the climate change. And you can see how powerful people, two powerful people business in the in Japanese and or in Indonesian uh, word, we can say we sell it like uh, selling a uh, fried banana because so many people will come and buy. And last but not least, it's me, myself. It's also my responsibility too, my lifestyle. I wear it every time and I promote. And this is my room, my bedroom, my mask, my bracelet, my <laughs> and I'm here right now behind this uh, old buttocks. This is my computer and I'm here. So this is what, if we want to mitigate something, we have to start from ourselves and then our family and our society. Thank you. Wow, amazing, Ibu. It's like every, every new slide you open, it's like, oh, wow, this is amazing. And it all meets all the SDG, yeah? And I'm wearing a batik, but it's not indigo, so I'm like, <laughs> okay, <laughs> okay. We move to the uh, last uh, speakers. We have Miss Nova. Miss Hello. Nova. Hello. Miss yeah. <laughs> Nova, the time is yours. Okay, yes. thank you. If I may ask Mbak Santi to play the video. That I give you. Terima kasih. Terima kasih. I think if you would like to know a lot about Arka Kinari, we have the website, yeah. it's called arkakinari.org. You can always visit it and it has a link to our YouTube and explain what Arka Kinari is. But I will give a little bit of brief of introduction. Um, first of all, I would like to say thank you for the two speakers before me. That was amazing. And it's very inspiring as well. And thank you for uh, ICOMOS and Quality Sunny uh, already entrusting this to me to talk about art and climate mitigation. So my name is Nova Rus. I'm from Malang, Indonesia. Dari gunung turun ke laut from the mountain went down to decided to went down to the sea because I think it's already time for us to give more um, attention to the sea that we always put behind us. So now we, it's, it's time to face uh, the fact that the sea is um, giving us most of the oxygen 
every day. It's giving uh, the majority of the oxygen rather than land because practically it has, we have the earth have more uh, water, no? more sea than the land. <clears throat> so when Basanti was contacting me, because she was expressing that, if I can tell the story, yeah, she was expressing that it's very hard to find the artist that also an environmental activist as well. So in Indonesia, she didn't get any um, recommendation. And I was telling her that I've been doing this, I've been trying to bring up environmental awareness more than 20 years, basically. But the fact that there is that um yeah, like that worry about not so many artists that talk about environmental issues for me it's like okay so then we need to work more as artists also we need to uh stop uh thinking that talking about environmental issue is something very scary the fact about environmental issue at the moment is legit and scary but it doesn't mean that we cannot take roles on this movement so I'm, i won't give any presentation here because it's just a, just an open open conversation for the next 10 minutes maybe now already um the problem was when i was in this well while i'm inside this movement the general problem was that there are a lot of activism and talking about environmental issue always focused on the victimization. So the method is always about being a victim of something and then highlighting the, the victim as well. But nobody realized that at the moment we are all victims of this, the victims of the condition that we cause as well. So rather than, than always focus on, on another victim, so we have to realize that we are also victims. And then we have to start taking action and taking roles. Because in Arka Kinari, we thought that, you no, know, is it not the time to talk about like, you know, like, like focus on one thing and that person as victim anymore because we are all victims. So it's all about putting art uh, and taking roles to, contribute to the change that we want to see. So if we talk about mitigation on Argatinari, we said that sometimes the fastest solution to be res to be resilient in climate change is to take it is to take it slowly, is to have a slow living. That's why we choose this boat as a method. Uh, this boat is a platform, this is the method, and it's a manifestation of art and the thing that we have been talk about so far in the past 20 years. So we're taking it slow. We don't do an excessive world tour anymore. The fact that if we're, if we're doing that is also contributing a significant amount of carbon footprint. That's why from 2019, we decided to take everything slower. It's a slow tour. We need to live slow, but act faster. So our action, if you talk about the, what's tangible and intangible, our action is definitely tangible. The action is tangible because it's daily. But what we want to see is very intangible. Because what we want to see is whoever witness what we're doing, especially the young people, is to add an environmental aspect in whatever they're doing. It doesn't matter if it's art. It doesn't matter if it's science. It doesn't matter if they are working for an NGO. It doesn't matter. But just put an environmental aspect in it because we don't force anyone to suddenly buy boats and then live, like prepare ourselves for a water world, but not, that's not definitely not what we want. But to put environmental aspect 
on daily basis. It doesn't need to be big because if we are talking about something big, sometimes it sounds very really hard. So um, also, why, why Indonesia? Because we found this boat in Netherlands after a two years of search. So we decided to just upcycle an old boat. This tall ship, a small tall ship, was made on 1947. And it's already nenek nenek. <laughs> but we, we prefer to just make it better because that's also the philosophy of being environmentally conscious to upcycle. It's not to just buy new things. So we decided to, to, to take this boat from Netherlands and then deliver it for one year from August 2019 and then arrived in Indonesia because of the pandemic. We thought that we're going to have nine months of timeline of delivering the boat, but apparently it became one year because of the pandemic. So finally we are here and we, we are ready to contribute to share and making exchanges. Why Indonesia? Because a lot of people in the world always think Indonesia as a really beautiful paradise place. But in fact, there are a lot of exploitations and industry that contribute a lot to climate change, but they are always hidden. They are always not in a plain sight. So my role, and my partner's role in Arka Kinari as artists, our role is to show, is to open that, you know, that curtain that has been, has been uh, hiding all of the things that very non-environmental friendly. So that's our role. We put that into lyrics, we put that into music, we put that also into visuals. So uh, at daytime, we are hosting workshops, concerts uh, for the local artists around us, cooking together. But then at nighttime, the boat is converted into a big stage with visuals and we bring our own uh, sound systems. We, we rig our own stage. We also include the sea and the boat as the protagonist of the show. So what is the relation? Like what, what do we inherit if we are talking about the World Heritage Day? I was writing something as I listened to the presentations. So I was writing something like as a human, of course, I inherit the Mother Earth. As an Indonesian, I inherit the spirit of freedom. As a Javanese, I inherit the language, the philosophy, and wisdom. So just like anything we inherit, our task is to nurture and develop the function of it as the world advancing, but not to exploit it, not to sell it, and more importantly, not to neglect. So for me, that's what I inherit today. And I will try every day to not harm in, instead of I will try to contribute in nurturing what we are having now. So in the beginning, there was already because I was thinking to explain the song that I will sing to end this session, but but Chili already Making, making a quotation of a song called Imbang. Thank you, really thank you uh, for that. I guess what you've already said, or what you already quote, um, that's what happened at the moment, yeah. So it is like what's green in the earth is already replaced by, by drought. And we are also facing so many ecological frictions I come from Malang. It's very high elevation, but we face flood every day. So as artists and, and cultural uh, activists, I would like to ask 
all artists, activists, and cultural people here to not having any more excuse to not talk about environmental issue because that's what important right now because we are on a crisis because we have a superpower to deliver the message in a more fluid and creative way and that will create a very short term change but when we do it constantly we also talking about consistency and commitment before then hopefully we will see the change in our lifetime and generation. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mbak Nova. Uh, now we will open for the question and answer session. If you have question, maybe you can turn on your microphone and read your question. Any question? Or maybe a drop a chat here is also welcome. I will try to find from the chat box. Is there any question? Mbak Santi, is there any question from the chat box? No, so far, um, no questions uh, presented here. Okay. We're still waiting. If you have any question for Ms. Mariana Isa, Ibu Sita, or Mbak Nova, you are welcome. If there's no question, maybe I have one question for Ibu Laredna. Is that okay to start off? Yeah, 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 sure. Ibu Laredna, I love, I love natural batik dyes. <laughs> I, I, I think the first time I saw them in um, Jogja went crazy because it can go, it can be really intricate can? and the color palette is something that is very classy, very, very elegant. Um, now, I just have a question about um, what do you think, how do you think, or um, looking at Batik and then expanding the, um, the promotion to a re at, at a regional level, because there's always this, <laughs> this has been this, um, uh, this, not dispute, I say this discussion about Batik, who owns Batik, where it originated and all. But uh, how do you see it? Um, how do you see um, the collaboration on uh, Baltic culture, Baltic heritage uh, between at least Malaysia, Indonesia, and Singapore? Is there any um, way or are there any F ongoing efforts to do so? Okay, thank you, Mariana. Langsung ya, Mbak? Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Yes, uh, last time we had a, a exhibition in Kuala Lumpur that presented uh, the batik that uh, utilized in a royal wedding ceremony. So we try to, to, to show what kind of uh, patterns usually wear by the bride and groom and also the family and others. So those kind of things actually will be the starting point for, for uh, collaborations. And we usually organize what is called Jogja World Baltic City. And we invited also the, uh, our colleagues from uh, Malaysia, Singapore, Thailand, ASEAN, yeah, for instance. And there is also a group, TT ASEAN is textile, blah, 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 uh, <laughs> Southeast Asia. So it's a, uh, we call it the Wastra. So this organization is led by the, the wife of the second king in Yogyakarta. But uh, usually we organize a lot of activities and this, uh, our next years will be in Kuala Lumpur. 
and then will be organized in Kuala Lumpur to meeting. It's not just about batik, but all traditional textiles. So this kind of movement is already there. And I think we can follow and we can also encourage everybody to once again, promote the utilizations of natural dye. Yeah. Not just only for batik, but also for other traditional textiles. Thank okay. You. Thank you, Ibu. Uh, if I can add it, maybe this is relates uh, with, not only with the experience of batik indigo, but it relates with how the collective effort at a regional level, as the Miss Mariana Isa mentioned before during her presentation, the sustainable effort, so if we uh, conclude from Ibu Sita, so what we need to do is mapping the community, mm -hmm. the same community, right? Yeah. Or the organization and active to hold an activity such as exhibition. That's what uh, artists can do with their organization to enlarge the promotion and also uh, the coverage, yeah, Bu? Yes, right. Yeah. And there are many, many uh, various uh, groups already in these uh, regions. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, we have another question here. Should be 350 or 3,200 3, pupils, especially youth and to this webinar, how to connect with you? Thank you so much. This is from Daniel Butler, Dharma Nature uh, Time. So, you can hear this webinar. So uh, this question, uh, I give it to Ibu Mariana Isa. Tiga tiganya. Oh, tiga tiganya. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Start with you first. Yeah. Hi, Diane. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for the question. Um, I I think a lot of people talk about when they, they talk about uh, youth engagement. Uh, the first. Um, suggestion would be, oh, social media, because that's apparently where they're all at. Um, but this, this, I think, could also be rather superficial, right? Like how, because on social media, it just comes and go. It doesn't stay with you. It could go viral. It could be popular for, uh, you could get your attention span for four minutes or three minutes of that day and then it just <laughs> not all can stay i still believe that it has to be nurtured in a way that the youth could actually experience it right like you said yesterday diane uh, uh, dalam hati uh, it has to be there <laughs> rooted in their hearts um so going and and the only way to do that is really uh go go back to uh, review our education system and see where we could inject um, these kind of um, ideas or connection. I, I, I'm not saying that social media would not be effective. I'm, I'm just saying that it's not the only uh, method out there. Um, and, and artists, because they're, they have this ability to be very honest, <laughs> I think that's a trait that all artists must be proud of. <laughs> Not everyone can be as honest as, and, and as bland and, or as um, direct as they can be. And, um, and their work could actually address the younger people. Um, in, I, I think that would be a good way and um, to see how artists could be influencers um, in shifting that cultural uh, mindset, or or maybe see how culture could actually change our mindset. Maybe Bularena and Nova have would have other <laughs> input, better input. Okay, yeah, I think what we are doing first of all is uh, we have classes for elementary schools. We have classes also for foreign foreigners, uh, university students in our Kajamada University, they have a lot of uh, foreign students. And uh, they practically try to work with, they can understand how difficult. So once they understand this is difficult, then they will 
of course you, you can I have to buy the real batik. Mm. This is the real batik is that. And then this kind of uh, method actually that we try also to promote all over the world with this kind of things. However, webinar like uh, Ibu Diana, hello Ibu Diana, <laughs> uh, mentions uh, how to connect with uh, youth. From my experience also, they don't like to talk and talk. They want to just actions. They want to, to do something. And then what we, we can do is, of course, we can organize something, some activities uh, for the youths. And in the case of international folk art market, because uh, they organize this market for three days. The first day, everybody to, has to pay 250 US dollars. Secondly, in the morning, 175 US dollars. And then afternoons will be 100 or something. And then the last day will be uh, $50. But the students under 18 years old is free. So this is something that uh, uh, they try also to promote this kind of folk art for 40 years. I think this kind of, um, of facilitations we need in our region too. Not only we have to go to United States to do this, but I think we have to, 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 to develop this kind of a, a program in our regions. Maybe that's what I can say. Thank you. Madam do you want to add it, something? Sure. Um, I think if our method, yeah, but of course everything happened uh, quite organically here. So. Uh, also, I'm a Scorpio, so I work intuitively. You know? so, <laughs> um, internally, internally, we are trying to work with the young people as well because we have uh, uh, two teams, which is the land and the sea teams. And we try to always involve uh, young people. I'm still young too, right? So maybe I can be considered as youth. As well. um, so that's that's internally and then also there is something externally as well that we are trying there was a question before uh, between me and my partner gray uh we were like what which what kind of boat that we will use a small or a big one so then we have a conclusion that it should be big because then it will be striking and then we we work with a really great a visual artist called Shrine from New York, and he was voluntarily painting this boat, and he painted dominantly yellow. Mm. So then the blue and the yellow stripe on the boat is very striking, and to be honest, um, we don't really like yellow color, right? As the person who lives on the boat, but we don't have to see that because it's on the outside of the boat. So it's very striking yellow and it worked. So everybody in the Dermaga here on the ports here, they said like, oh yeah, you come from the yellow boat. Sometimes they call it the banana boat. So visually it's very fast to go into the memory yeah. and then it stays there. And also we um, trying to make workshops as well and the workshops is about basic uh, sailing knowledge and boat management so we've been working with some schools here as well to do that because the boat when I say big but it's not as big as a Noah's Ark yeah? so it's 18 meters on deck so I can only take like nine uh, nine people who want to join the workshop and it's also much more effective. And for us who facilitate the workshop, it's much, much more, um, uh, we can focus more. So it's not so, because I came from a education, um, when I was in elementary school, I, I was in Taman Siswa and they are very focused, like they don't have too many students. So then they focus each, each student and it worked really well for me. And I have never forget about the, education that I get so learning from that on the workshop that we are hosting is also like that so 
it's not only for 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 youth but it's for kids as well for women uh, and sometimes it's random and then we also trying to make the unreachable reachable like we we went a lot to the remote islands of indonesia that never really access a contemporary performance so we came there as well so this is all the attempt to plan the dream of the youth that we visited thank you diane okay. for your okay so if i conclude from the three speakers uh, it's not only theoretical for the youth, uh, the effective one. It's not only theoretical, but also the hands-on. And uh, Ms. Nova also uh, added for the appearance, uh, the appearance should be interesting for them. So maybe if uh, connected with Taman Siswa, then this method, uh, same with the Hanya Dewantara method, yeah? Kita rasa entar saya, hands-on work, and then goes to their mind and also goes to their heart. Uh, maybe we can give. Oh, oh the time is up. We only have two minutes. Uh, do you want to give one more question, or I need to close this? One more question. Then, uh, uh, Mr. Tony, Mr. Tony, please. All right. Thank you so much, um, Mbak. So first of all, I would like to thank all the speaker that sharing the beautiful and insightful stories coming from this uh, conversation. I would like to know uh, from Ibu Laretna about the disappear of the local pattern because you, you mentioned uh, that on the, the, the uh, your presentation. How how can we as a public support you on this for suffering those kind of uh, disappearing of the the pattern? Because I believe losing a pattern, meaning that losing a, a history, losing a civilization of the whole, the long stories of our stories, basically. So yeah, I mean, like, um, that's really, really uh, uh, sad to know that there are disappearing pattern that happening in Indonesia, especially in Batik. And how can we as a public support you on, on this? That's the first one. Second one, I would like to also share my, uh, my, my, my name is Tony from the t50.org and we do have the a special program called the Weave of Hope that will be start to collecting those kind of stories and collecting all those kind of um, uh, uh, art then related with the climate uh, crisis. Thank you. Back to you, Mbak. Yeah, thank you for the question, Ibu Sita. Yes, thank you, Pak Tony. Um, from our experience, there, and we can learn also from the museum that there are a lot of patterns, the old type of the patterns that now is difficult. The, the, what, we, what I call it's disappearing. It's not just about we cannot find anymore, but there is no person that can writing with those kind of patterns. So this is something that now we, we, we try to, to, to do more and more. And then you mentioned what you can contribute, just buy, buy, buy. That's the words that then the uh, batik crafter, they will develop more and more. And finally, there will be for us is, oh, this is new pattern. But actually, no, this is old patterns that they encourage for them also to make and to write again and again. So because of the market, so the most important is, of course, once again, is market. Like the one for the natural indigo dial, the market certain level because the the uh, natural indigo day in Yogyakarta is not our market. Yes, we understand about this one, but uh, there are still a lot of market in the world. So that's why we have to 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 market once again, and the marketers, the market, they can buy and buy and buy. Thank you. Thank you, Ibu. So I will read the conclusion because the time is almost up. Uh, so from the first speaker, uh, the role of art in mitigating the impact of climate change from Ms. Mariana Isa. Art can help uh, us to delve into the complexity of the climate change. And then she also mentioned the scientists and artists can work together, education can be experimental, effort must be sustainable or consistent, and art and art administrator can develop a strategic plan and collective effort at a regional level. While from Ibu Sita, 
there is a lot. I make one sentence only. So the indigo batik, the art or the artist with their passion, with their action, they not only a uh, cultural diplomat, not only active in cultural diplomacy, but it can be an, a large uh, issue of the world, for example, environmental or climate change issue. So they become a non-state actor here for the climate change as well. And then from Ms. Dafa, um, here all the artists, they, they become the active again, the voice, the role, uh, the mitigating the impact of climate change. That's the conclusion from me, from the three speakers. Thank you for Ibu Ibu, Matras Mbandi World, for all insight and presentation. We also can read the thank you from the people. Or the greeting from the people from the chat box, and I leave it to Ba Ami as the MC. Thank you. Thank you, Bachili, um, and for all our wonderful presenters. That was a fruitful discussion that shed some new lights on um, on how arts and culture can contribute to tackle climate issues, and. It is indeed a complicated issue to explain sometimes to uh, general public, and hopefully with art we can touch people's heart. And um, with that in mind, uh, oh, sorry, before that, can we have a photo session together? <laughs> can all participants please open their cam so that I can take a screenshot here? Already, everyone's ready. One, two, and three. Satu kali lagi. One, two, three. Thank you. Okay. As we all know, we are honored to be in the presence of Miss Nova Ruth. I actually have written a, a paragraph long introduction for her work and who she is, but I think we already know who she is from her inspirational stories that we just saw and heard. And Miss Nova will perform a song for us, I believe. Miss Nova? Yes. Yes. <laughs> so. <laughs> Everyone, please welcome Miss Nofarup. So, I have, I have already here the kids of my friends are jumping into the stage next day. Um, so this song called Imbang, as Mbak Cili know, um, but I made this song in the middle of the pandemic when I was separated from the boat for more than six months. I uh, was in Indonesia and the boat was like stateless in Pacific. And I had like a really deep um, contemplation that time, that thing that maybe this is what, what I need, what the world needs. Maybe the world needs to reset like a lot of uh, contemplation, contemplation. So Inbang is balance. Song goes like this. <laughs> Oh, 
Muncul dari ufuk timur menyapu bintang sinari. Ibu bumi yang birunya tampak lebih dari hijaunya. Kini tergantikan dengan tanah kekeringan. Dan aiba di sisi lain ibu bumi terus bertahan. Suatu hari Apa yang kita ambilkan di minta lagi karena keseimbangan kan terus dijaga oleh air dan api tanah dan angin dan kita manusia pun harus mengaku bahwa kita tak lebih besar dari sang gunung. Bersama semesta Terima kasih sudah mendengarkan. That was very beautiful, Mbak Nova. Terima kasih, Amin. Iya, yeah. and with that performance, I I think we close this talk show. And but beforehand, um, I would also like to remind all of you that there is one more important event that will happen this afternoon by iCommerce Indonesia. Still in celebration of World Heritage Day, Heritage and Climate, that invites Mr. Gabriel Victor Caballero from the focal point of the focal point for sustainable development goals for ICOMOS International and Mr. Punto Wijayanto from ICOMOS Indonesia with Ms. Ratri Wulandari as the moderator. The talk will happen this afternoon at 3 p.m. Jakarta time. Thank you once again for ICOMOS Indonesia, Koalisi Seni and Ekspresi for organizing this wonderful discussion talk show. Thank you once again for the speakers, the moderator, and all participants. I will see you this afternoon. Happy World Heritage Day. Bye. Thank you so much, Ami, to you. And thank you, everyone, to you. Terima kasih, sampai ketemu. Terima kasih ya semuanya. Ya, terima kasih semua. Jumpa lagi. Terima kasih. Amin.